Welcome to tonight's show. My name is Alexa. I'm the head of online community for House Call Pro. I am joined by my co-host, Roland, who's co-founder of House Call Pro, and Mel, who is our senior vice president of People. Each evening at 5 p.m., Monday through Thursday, we share the state of the world according to the home service industry. And then we focus on one main topic or guest. Tonight, we are super excited to welcome managing partner at Miracle Mile Advisors, Kevin Barlow. He'll be back here after Mel does the state of the world. If you are wondering where to watch past episodes, we had a killer lineup this week. So if you want to watch any of those past ones, go to our YouTube channel, House Call Pro, and just type in coronavirus, or there's a playlist up at the top of um, pre-recorded videos for you from the past seven weeks. And also, if you're not yet in our Facebook group, please get in there. We are over 2,900 members in there, just constantly talking, asking for advice, giving advice during this time as a home service business owner. I'll post both links in in the chat. Other than that, over to you, Mel, for our State of the World. I'll be back with Kevin in a few minutes. Great. Um, good evening. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'm Melina Fairley, Senior Vice President of People at House Call Pro. Um, please feel free to call me Mel. And we do come to you live Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific to give you a daily recap on the news out in the world related to coronavirus. And we bring you information and guests, a place to have community, and hopefully um, get some inspiration and advice. So by way of introduction, if you haven't joined us before, I'm not a reporter um, or a doctor, infectious disease expert, none of that. I am a human resources professional um, with over 20 years of experience. And personally, I'm a homeowner, uh, now working from home, mom of four in these strange times, and um, happy to come to you every night, answer employment questions, and hopefully update you a little bit on the news. So with that, here's your evening update for Thursday, April 30th, 2020. The Johns Hopkins dashboard is reporting globally over 3.2 million cases. There we go. This is our this is this cool updated map. This gets updated throughout the day. So 3.2 million cases, over 233,000 deaths globally, uh, and almost a million people recovered. And here in the U.S., we're measuring 1.06 million cases recorded at this time. There you go and almost, you'll see there are almost 63,000 deaths and over 125,000 people have recovered. There we go, 126, 122 as of this time. So Johns Hopkins is continuing to monitor the trends in the states that have started to ease social distancing measures. We know we're hearing a lot about that. Um, they said it could be several weeks before effects begin to emerge in the reported data, but we'll keep you posted on that. Overall, the daily incidence or the daily new cases in the U.S. has remained relatively steady since early April, so non-escalation is a good thing. Um, on the economic front, this week the U.S. Department of Labor announced that an additional 3.8 million new unemployment insurance claims were filed last week. So this is lower than a couple of the other weeks, but the national unemployment total and the unemployment rate both set historical records for the previous week. So almost 18 million individuals and 12.4% respectively. So in some incredible numbers. So what does that mean? That means that in total, Americans have filed more than 30 million new unemployment claims over the past six weeks. Uh, we reported on a poll in March. Well, they've reconducted this poll, uh, NPR, PBS, and Marist. And half of the respondents reported that someone in their household has lost their job or had their hours decreased. So half of the people polled, and that was more than double the percentage that we saw when the poll was conducted in March. So the unemployment situation continues to, to be troubling. Uh, we are seeing states opening soon, as I mentioned earlier. So in those states, for example, Iowa and Oklahoma, um, some of these states are issuing early warnings to laid off or furloughed workers, um, indicating that they need to return to their jobs if they're asked to do so, or risk losing those unemployment benefits. Yeah, we've seen some of our pros in, in the coronavirus group and the house call pro group to say, hey, my, my employee doesn't wanna come back because right. they're making more money on unemployment than, than what I was willing to pay them. Uh, but it sounds like um, what at least Iowa and Oklahoma are starting to, to do or to, to let people know is that there is that risk that they might lose those those benefits. Right. So that those increase in benefits were the two trillion dollar in the congressional coronavirus relief package that was signed in March. So those added six hundred dollars to the weekly unemployment benefit checks from the federal government to out of work Americans, and 
this is what has business owners concerned. This is what has some of our pros concerned because in some examples, people might be making as much or more on unemployment. So in Iowa, for example, state officials have actually posted a public call for companies to get in touch if any employee refuses to return to work. Um, and that's especially significant in Iowa because we reported earlier in the week that President Trump signed an executive order Tuesday that could result in meat processing plants staying open, of which Iowa has some. And in general, states have the legal right to revoke benefits if unemployed Americans are offered jobs comparable to their past positions yet declined to take them. And that's been the standard always in unemployment. Um, and recently the US Department of Labor did affirm that, quote, barring unusual circumstances, a request that a furloughed employee return to his or her job very likely constitutes an offer of suitable employment that the employee must accept. So there, there's certainly debate out there on this topic right now, and I know lots of our folks are experiencing this. Um, Tennessee also came out, for example, and said it may potentially disqualify claimants from receiving unemployment benefits if workers who are temporarily laid off turn down an opportunity to retake their jobs. So we'll be watching this closely. I know this is getting a lot of, of conversation um, in our Facebook group as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mel, for the state of the world. We will see you back here on Monday. Remember, you guys, we don't do Friday broadcasts anymore. So Mel, thank you, as always, for reporting. And let's go ahead and bring our guest on, Kevin Barlow. So go ahead and um, start your video and unmute yourself. Awesome. Hi, Kevin. Welcome. So um, welcome, Kevin Barlow. He is the managing partner at Miracle Mile Advisors, and he's going to be sharing his strategies for essential financial planning during this time and give his thoughts on where the financial markets may be heading. So any questions that you have for Kevin throughout this time, make sure you're putting it in the Q&A box, and I'll come back at the end and ask Kevin and Roland to go over the top voted one. So if you see one in there, that's the question you want to ask, upvote it so it does get answered by Kevin. Other than that, I'll be back at the end to ask those questions and I'm going to pass it off to you gentlemen. All right. Thanks so much, Alexa. All right, Kevin. So I think we just got to start with um, first the basics. Um, maybe if you could just walk us through what's what's happening with just the economy in general uh, and things that you're seeing. Obviously, our pros are feeling a certain thing, but what are you seeing on your end and what are you kind of advising and talking to your clients about? Yeah, the, the, the GDP number came out um, earlier this week with an, an annualized loss of 4.8%, of which means that, you know, over the course of the next year, they're expecting the economy to shrink by 4.8% based on what occurred last quarter. Um, estimates for next quarter are, are anywhere from negative 12% to negative 36% annualized. And, and that's a four quarter number. So that means that the growth next quarter would be between negative three and, and negative 9%. So that's a, a pretty big um, drop. Uh, to put that in perspective, in 2008, the, you know, the economy only dropped at 8% uh, annualized. Um, and, and the biggest reason for that has been um, the, the shutdown of uh, businesses and the resulting unemployment. So uh, Mel mentioned a lot of those numbers, but you know, 30 million people unemployed is, is a big, um, big yeah. number. And the government's doing a lot to, to try to alleviate that in the short term. Um, but there's, there's, there's both short term and long term effects there. Yeah, and obviously, you know, the government has passed a, a bunch of bills um, in which we're going to kind of dissect some of the ones that you pros should be either taking advantage of and at the very least know. Uh, we talked a lot about PPP and EIDL loans um, out there. Um, and with, you know, one in five, one in four here in San Diego, people unemployed. Um, do you think um, the Fed's response has been um, adequate? Do they need to do more? Do they need to do less? Like, what are you, what are you kind of seeing out there and how do you feel about it? Yeah, the, the Fed's uh, response has been to, to flood the economy with liquidity, both the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and Congress. And that really came because they, they kind of learned their lesson in 2008 and 2009. Um, if you remember back then, uh, there were a bunch of congressional votes where they decided not to pass stimulus packages and, and the stock market dropped and the economy dropped following that. So they're, they're sort of on the other end right now of, of flooding the money, flooding the economy with money with the hopes that, that that gets us through the next three or six months and, and everything returns to normal. Um, the stock market, you know, tends to move ahead of the economy. So the big drops that we saw at the end of February, at the end of March, were the stock market telling you that the economy is going to be rough over the next three, six months. And it started to recover really once the Federal Reserve 
put all that money into the system once the treasury department uh, started sending out checks and um, doing a lot of other um, things that that really kind of took some financial pressure off the system um, you know th their objective is that because this isn't a financial crisis it's more of an event driven recession with the, the coronavirus being the, the cause of it um, that uh, if we can get through the next three months or, or six months, um, you know, there's no one's quite sure on the exact time, by helping people that have been laid off, by by putting money out in the system, by uh, lowering lending standards, by paying people not to, to lay people off, um, then the system will, will revert. And, and the stock market's response has been and very positive to that, you know, going back to the last five weeks since March 23rd. Yeah, I feel like what a lot of people, um, you know, when they see, wow, how is stock like it's almost back to where it was almost, you know, some people are seeing 10% a, a little bit under, um, but they think about, wow, how could that be, you know, with a quarter of people not having jobs, but I think you kind of nailed on the head, which is, you know, they're looking a little bit further ahead, and they're looking at things that um, drive certainty, um, obviously, because it's events driven, maybe a vaccine would actually put everyone back to work, you know, given we could get enough of them out there. So they're reacting to a lot of this kind of news. Um, what are some things that our pros should be looking for as, in terms of signals from the stock market that they can apply maybe in the short term, uh, maybe even for their business? I, I think one of the things that, that they may want to look at is, you know, what's happening to the broader market. When we talk about the stock market, you know, five companies make up almost 20% of the S&P 500 and that the top 500 companies have done very well. But if you start to look at the smaller companies, you know, their, their losses have been almost double what the big companies have. And if you kind of extra extrapolate that to small businesses, the, the pressure of what's occurred really has been on the small business owner, the smaller companies, and it's been the big companies that have come through. So small businesses are, are going to um, fare much more in line with, with smaller companies um, than they are with the Facebooks and the Amazons and the Microsofts of the world. So to, one of the things that I think you'll want to see to see if the economy is going to approve for your business is how some of the smaller public companies are doing as opposed to just how the bigger public companies are doing. Yeah, I feel like that's really great advice because sometimes it's really easy to see these crazy great numbers and you're like, well, what about me? And then you, you, you know, you often you know, think about, okay, well, um, what else is out there? What stocks are not doing good? Um, at some point, you know, I, I want to dive into tonight um, just a couple of different things. Just, you know, what are strategies for, for everybody that they should be thinking about from their financial perspective? Um, and then for some of our pros that are watching today um, that have never invested before, you know, what are some ideas um, given kind of the state where things are? Is now the time to invest? And then for people that already have some investments out there, you know, what do they need to do to optimize kind of their existing portfolios and what they should be thinking about? So maybe uh, I feel like it would be good to just talk overall. Let's let's talk about just financial planning for all during these times and where there are not necessarily loopholes, but extra advantages that they should be looking at um, specifically because of the things that have been passed by the government that they could make use of. Sure. Um, you know, there, there could be advantages to your future investing to have a year where your income, your business income may be lower. Um, you can qualify for things like a Roth IRA where maybe you hadn't qualified in the past and you can invest money um, that will be tax deferred for the, for the, the future. And there are income caps on that. So for, for people who've had successful businesses, but this may be a year that, you know, is, is off for, for obvious reasons, um, you know, they can invest in a Roth IRA and you know that uh, can help you know grow their business over time or grow their grow their portfolio over time. Um, the, the other thing that's occurred in, in tandem with the stock market is that interest rates are at all time low. The, the U.S. ten year government bond is at 0.6 percent or 0.7 percent right now, and that's tied to a lot of other things. A lot of business loans, a lot of mortgages, um, a lot of pretty much everything but credit cards are tied to to 10 year interest rates. So this really does provide an opportunity to speak to your lenders, to speak to your, um, whether they be a business lender or a mortgage lender, um, to see if it makes sense to refinance a loan. Um, most of these lenders would much rather keep that loan on the books by giving you uh, better terms than have you default on that. So whether it's a mortgage, whether it's a business loan, the, the economic weakness and the Fed, Federal Reserve lowering rates have provided some opportunities on that side. 
Um, they really do want to, to stimulate the economy with lower rates. Um, you know, and, and for companies with, that have strong balance sheets right now and their businesses, um, you know, continuing to do well, you know, those low rates can, can allow you to borrow. Per, perhaps with unemployment high, you can pick up um, some employees at a lower cost than you would have. So yep. um, the, the ability to borrow right now from, especially from small and mid-sized banks at low rates is, is very good for people, who, companies who still have strong balance sheets, um, you know, to, to be successful in a time that, that others are hurting uh, usually can be pretty good for, for your business. Yeah, I feel like now is definitely an opportune time and really, you know, there's the businesses that even survived just through this time, um, they're going to be rewarded because there's going to be the same, if not more demand and less supply, you know, if you think of yourself as a supplier. Um, so typically what that means is higher prices <laughs> and you can charge more and you're going to feel overwhelmed with a lot more jobs than maybe you'd be accustomed to, in which case you should price yourself accordingly um, to the market, not necessarily gouge, but, you know, to the market and, and take advantage of that. But I think those, um, just the low rates just in general obviously the ppp has an ultra low rate um if you end up not using all of it um entirely and not for um the, the payment pr protection side of things but for the other things um obviously with the eidl2 it's also still a very low rate and it's over 30 years you have to pay that back so it's pretty much at the rate of inflation so it's kind of free money for the next 30 years um what are some um, tactics that you think would serve our pros well? Um, how do they, like which banks, if they don't already have an established relationship with a bank, or maybe they've gotten denied by their big bank, you know, their, their Chase, their Wells Fargo, their B of A, um, do you have any advice on, on what and how they should be kind of um, choosing their, their bank? Like where do, they, where do they get this? Yeah, I think we've gone to a world that's far more technological and you can do a lot of your, your banking online. And um, when times are good, it, it didn't matter if you were with one of the top five big banks or, or your local bank. But I think this has really proven that banking relationships still matter. Um, and, you know, the, the mid-sized banks, the regional banks, the local banks, you know, they're the ones who had people working all night to help small businesses while the, you know, the big Wall Street banks, um, you know, they get paid a percentage of the, the fee on the loan. So if you can only process a certain amount, they're going to go with the big loans. They're not going to go with the small businesses. Um, whereas your, your more regional bank, your more local bank, you know, they're invested in that relationship. Um, they're going to help you much more with payment terms. Um, you know, you've seen some of the bad press about, you know, Wells Fargo shutting off a lot of their customers, JP Morgan only going with their big customers. But you've seen a lot of good press about, you know, regional banks, you know, the bank that may have 10 or 20 branches. Um, but, you know, the loan officer knows who you are. The loan officer knows your business and, you know, they're, they're a part of the community. Um, you know, those type of banks have come through um, a lot more for their clients um, in the last, you know, call it six weeks than, than the big banks have. Um, so I think, you know, the technological world relationships still matter. Um, and knowing the person that is on the other end of that loan is, is still valuable. Um, and I know there's a lot of apps you can get loans from and those type of things. But when, when things go wrong, it's good to, it's good to have that person there that's going to, you know, cut you a little slack and, and help you try to get through that. So I, th I think those the small and medium sized banks are a great place to, to have those banking relationships. Yeah, and I think um, just one small tip for our pros here that they might not realize is just because, you know, let's say I live in San Diego, I don't necessarily have to go to San Diego Credit Union. I could actually go contact a credit union even in a different county. You know, there's not, you can't, it's not just based on where you live. Um, you're still going to get a person's phone number on the other side. You're still going to be able to build a relationship there too. So think about that. You're not just only related or um, tied to the ones that are exactly in your community. You can go outside it. Just take a look at them. The small, the mid-size, those relationships matter. And maybe they'll do that, you know, the good thing and, and push your application through a little um, quicker or give you the slack like you just mentioned because they, they know you a little bit. Um, let's, let's jump a little bit into kind of this, the financial planning for all here. Um, the CARES Act that, that passed, it's going to give, um, a couple extra things, um, that normally you couldn't do, uh, specifically, you know, when it comes to, um, pulling out some money on the personal side of things, um, what are some things that kind of you're seeing and that you're advising some of your clients, um, in terms of tips and advice there? Yeah, if you're seeing kind of a short-term um, hit in your business, and I know some people mentioned they have uh, 401ks, but also IRAs, um, you know, we, we never recommend uh, taking money out of your retirement accounts and kind of stealing from the future, um, but they have made that penalty free. So if you're having a, you know, a, um, a tough year and, um, you know, your income's going to be low, that is a place you can go. Uh, with IRAs also, you can borrow the money out of your IRA 
um, and you have 60 days to pay it back. So if you have a job that's being completed and you know, you know you're gonna get paid on you know, June 1st and you need money, one time per year you can take out an IRA. And do. 401ks also can be a very good lending source because if you have a 401k, you're paying the interest back to yourself instead of to someone else. Um, so, you know, long term is not something that you want to be using, you know, for long term loans, but for short term loans, most 401k plans have a provision that allow you to, you know, borrow money for 90 days or 180 days and pay the interest back to yourself as opposed to paying that interest to a, to a high uh, interest rate credit card or, or, or something of that nature. And in most cases, from a financial planning perspective, you, you do want to try to avoid credit card debt, which, you know, right now, the average rate on credit cards is 18 times the uh, average rate on a 10 year treasury. And it's, you know, probably close to 100 times what it is on your savings account. So, you know, trying to avoid those those credit card balances um, can can be, you know, really good in times like this as well. Yeah, I feel like that's a good tip. And obviously with the times that they are now, if you are looking to capitalize and maybe someone's selling their business or looking to get out um, and you need access to some cash quick, if you think you can return that better than you can catch the returns on the back end of, of whatever you, you, you invested in it, you have an opportunity there to, to put that to work pretty quick. Because, um, you know, like you said earlier too, there's employees that are going to be out there looking for jobs as soon as things come back that might not have a job to return back to. Um, and if you can soup up some good employees, um, even if you need a little extra buffer, those returns are probably going to pay off here as things start to kind of turn around. Um, so don't, don't forget about those for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about just the taxes, just in general. Obviously, I know um, the original time has passed <laughs> now by two weeks. Um, but um, what what do you think uh, about the new extension? Are, are there any, um, besides the, the obvious, not having to pay till later, um, are there any other things that are that are in there that you think um, our pros should take advantage of? Well, the new deadline is July 15th, um, both for the federal government and for, I believe, every state. I know, I know it is here in California. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean you have to do that. If, if you were paying quarterly taxes last year and you're due a refund, you can go out and get that refund right now. You don't have to, to wait to get it. On the other hand, if you owe money, you can put that off for three months. So it's given you a little bit of optionality in terms of when you file your taxes um, and when you either pay or, or get your refund. Um, and there's no um, interest accumulating all the way until July 15th. And, you know, July is going to be a pretty critical month here. That's something they may push back as well. So you want to, you know, pay, pay attention with your, with your accountant there. Um, there's also some, some um, changes in, in the law that allow you to, have, to um, recoup some past uh, business losses that were above caps and those type of things. So it's worth an email to your, to your accountant to say, you know, is there anything in this uh, CARES Act that changes that? Um, you know, we have an email we sent around here and there's probably 25 different provisions in there. And there's a good chance that one or two of those might apply to, to your business. So, you know, you, you pay your accountant for, for taxes, but, you know, there's a good chance that, you know, revising last year's taxes um, may actually save you some money. And it can actually all go back to all the way to 2018 for, for a handful of the different um, provisions. Yeah. So if you've got that CPA, that tax account that's helping you, um, have them review that because there's probably some extra things there that normally you wouldn't get in, a, in some, some year, right? Because we're in some extenuating circumstances here and the government's allowed for um, some some extra help for you guys there. So so let's talk um, a little bit about people that are looking to invest. I hear a lot of pros are like, oh, do you buy the dip? Roland, what are your stock picks? How are you thinking about it? Uh, what types of advice are you giving uh, first-time clients that, that are kind of coming to you uh, with the same thing that I just asked you? Yeah, I think for, for a first-time investor, um, it can be counterintuitive, but a stock market drop is actually a good time to get in. You know, that people like to say that stocks are the one thing that nobody wants to buy when they're on sale. Um, you know, stocks are priced relative to their, their future earnings, and, and we're expecting 2020 to be much lower earnings. But assuming that we come through this, at some point, 2021, 2022, you're, um, you're going to have a, a good price relative to the, to the future valuation. Um, so, you know, this is a good time if you have excess cash to, to get invested in the market. Um, you know, I, I keep going back to interest rates, you know, the, the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is three times what you can get from a 10 year bond right now. So even if you wait 10 years and let the prices bounce around for the next 10 years, you're being paid three times as much to own a stock as you are to own a bond. And we're believers that 
you know, the, the U.S. economy is resilient and that, that stocks will be worth more 10 years from now. I, I can't tell you if they're going to be worth more 10 days from now or, or six months from now, but we're big believers that, you know, a few years out to, to five to 10 years out, stocks are going to be worth more because stocks are, are the profits of U.S. companies. So, you know, when people go to work and make money and do that for big corporations, that increases the value of your stock. We, we often think of stocks as a, as a ticker symbol and a, a red or a green number, but, you know, they really are a claim on the future profits of, of that company. Yeah, I feel like um, one thing we talked about earlier when we chatted is just a little bit about diversification. And for a lot of our pros here, uh, almost the entirety or most of their net worth is uh, between two things, you know, their home and their business. And so oh, in this case, you know, um, as there is some uncertainty in business and there is some risk, maybe now is the right term to start thinking about diversification and really just betting on something more than just yourself, but just betting on the U.S. <laughs> in general. So and betting on yourself is you know, the best way to create wealth, yeah. but to grow wealth that you already have to have um, diversification and to have a broad exposure to the U S economy or to the global economy is a good way to, to take away a lot of that risk. Um, you know, if you run your business very well, you are going to make more money from your business than you are from your investment portfolio. There's no doubt about that. Um, but you know, there are going to be hiccups that affect your business more directly than they affect the overall U.S. economy. And if you have a, a portion of your net worth or a portion of your assets, you know, in the U.S. economy as a whole, you're not susceptible to um, things that occur only and only hurt one business or one industry. So for, for business owners, we very often suggest um, owning uh, assets that, that are different than their own business. So if your business is highly susceptible to the economy or highly susceptible to the technology industry, then it may make sense to own uh, different assets that aren't susceptible to the technology industry. Um, and, and we tend to look at broad ETFs and index funds where you can get exposure to 500 companies or 1,000 companies at the same time. And when you do that, you're really betting on the future of U.S. business as opposed to any one company and you can keep that specific bet for yourself and your own business. So when you're talking about index funds and ETFs, um, what is the general description of what those are for those that maybe haven't heard of them and maybe one or two examples that are, are the most common ones? Sure. The, the, um, the most common is the S&P 500 and the S&P 500 is you can buy that as an ETF or as an index fund. And what that means is you own shares of all 500 of the biggest public companies in America. So you really are owning the American economy. You can do that in a different ways, but you can also own something like a technology ETF. And when you do that, you're owning the 100 biggest technology companies in America. So you're betting on the technology industry. You can do that with financials. You can do that with energy. You can do that with small companies, big companies. But instead of buying one company, you're buying a, a bucket of companies. Um, and that takes away the risk of any one company having um, you know, a, a really bad year or, or going out of business or, or those type of things. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So obviously for people that have existing portfolios, you know, let's talk a little bit about kind of the risk and reward versus, you know, on these, these large cap companies. So like, you know, the, the big ones you'll hear about all day long on the TV, um, maybe mid cap and small cap. Um, what are some things that, you know, for people that already have some money in the stock market right now that either still have money in there or took it out, um, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, the, the, the one certainty moving forward is that there's going to be uncertainty. Um, so, T the companies that tend to do best with uncertainty and, and our uh, company's bias right now is toward larger companies. Larger companies are the ones who still have access to the bond market. They still have access to loans. They have enough capital that they're picking up talent from smaller companies who are laying people off. Um, so the, the larger companies is an area we think there's a better risk adjusted return. When the stock market went down in March, the larger companies only went down about half as much as the smaller companies. Um, on a global basis, we still think the U.S. is the less risky place. Um, we have a, a more dynamic economy. We have less regulations. We really do have an ability to grow business wealth here in a way that um, is stronger than, than across a lot of other places in the world. Um, and, you know, when you, when you invest in emerging markets and, and those type of places, you take on a lot of risk. In emerging markets, for things like China or Brazil or India, you take on a lot of risk in these type of situations. The U.S. dollar still is the world's currency. So when you're invested in U.S. companies, you tend to have a lot more stability because of, of their size and their strength and their, their global relationships. Yeah, I think that's important for people just to, just to realize on that, kind of on that note. I feel uh, pretty strongly that 
everyone should know the kind of the basics is that in the long time horizon, you almost can't make a bad bet, <laughs> you know, especially if you're doing what you're saying, because it's just a matter of time, um, even if there is short term uncertainty. Yeah. And I think we, we sent over the chart um, that I think is on the, the post on the, the website. You know, the, the U.S. stock market is very resilient. Um, it, it, over long periods of time, it tends to average about six and a half to seven percent above inflation. And that doesn't sound like a, a, an amazing number. But if you're getting a 7% return, it means you're doubling your money every 10 years. So if you're looking at returns of 7 to 10%, you're doubling those assets every 7 to 10 years. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not quite as, as fun as buying, you know, one stock and watching it double overnight. But when you buy that broad market, you really have the ability to double your money um, over those type of time periods. And, you know, for someone who might have, you know, 25 years till retirement, you know, that may mean that money could be, you know, six times the size by the time it's, it's there 25 years ago. And, and that's been resilient through the Great Depression, World War II, Vietnam War, Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, all of those different type of things, the stock market still really had that ability to, to compound wealth. And that's because it's people going to work and making profits for businesses. Yeah, so I think one thing we, we talked about on our, on our pre-call here is a little bit about how you know pros and investors that have these new portfolios, you really should be focusing on companies um, that have strong balance sheets and income statements why like why is that maybe are there some that you can provide kind of as like a, a barometer as an example of what you're talking about yeah i mean we we really like quality companies quality companies are defined as ones that have strong balance sheets if you have a very strong balance sheet you tend to see opportunity when others are seeing threats um, you tend to have much more consistent businesses and the way we think about that is if your family could only own one business and they had to own it for the next three generations and it was the only business they could ever own You'd want a company that, that had a lot of cash on the balance sheet. You'd want a company that, you know, you wouldn't want a company that made 50% earnings one year and negative 50 the next. You'd want a company that made 10% each year. So you want these kind of consistent type of earnings. Um, we like companies that, that generate a lot of cash flow um, because companies that generate cash flow tend to be companies that are going to do just fine during downtimes. Um, you know, there are always kind of examples of, of quality companies. Um, the most uh, kind of, Standard one is, is a company like Johnson & Johnson. You know, um, people are still buying diapers. People are still buying toothpaste. People are still buying medical supplies. They may not be going out and investing in a new technology system or a new, um, you know, taking out new loans from the bank, but they're going to buy those essentials. So, so there's an area of the market called consumer staples and, and companies like Clorox and uh, Walmart and Costco and Johnson & Johnson tend to be stalwarts of the American economy and continue to, to do well whether it's in great times or, or in bad times. Um, a lot of the big technology companies now that we didn't think that about 20 years ago now really have strong balance sheets. Apple has billions of dollars of, of cash on its balance sheet. Microsoft does as well. So those big stalwart type companies are gonna tend to be the ones that, uh, that hold up the best and, and you don't risk losing your permanent capital. If, you know, if a stock goes down 30%, chances are you're gonna get your money back. If a stock goes bankrupt, you're not. So we tend to try to avoid companies that have high leverage or a lot of debt because companies that have a lot of debt have a higher likelihood of going bankrupt. Yep. And I think you, you can largely avoid those ones too by diversifying. So when you're yep. looking at, you know, these, these ETFs, um, don't really go down the leverage route unless you really know what you're doing, but uh, you know, just standard ETFs and you can, you can do that by looking at, you know, the consumer, um, well, depends on what you want to get. I won't, don't want to give too many stock advice kind of, um, ideas here. Um, but but take a look around um, and make bets that are not your own. So let's talk a little bit about um, timing the market. I know everyone's always like, all right, is this the bottom? You know, when do I, I got my cash saved up, I'm ready to go in. Um, what's your advice? Is this, um, you know, when do you think is the right time to throw it all in on on, on black, <laughs> you know, or, or, or when, do, when, like, what do you think is the, the best way that people should be thinking about it? So I think the best advice I've read recently on that is don't try to make one great decision, meaning sell at the top or buy at the bottom. Try to make a number of small good decisions. So when times feel really bad and the stock market's down 20%, that's a good time to, to put a little bit more in. You know, when times feel really euphoric and, and the stock market's up a lot, it's hard to do, but that's a time you want to pare back. But you want to do that with, with small percentages of your portfolio. You don't want to go all in or all out. You know, the people that, that tend to get in the most trouble are the ones who get very fearful when the market drops and they pull everything out. 
and then they end up getting back in at higher prices and they, there was an opportunity cost to that. They, they, they lost money by not losing money because they, did, they lost those gains when things uh, bounced back. Um, so we tend to try to think, make a lot of small dis good decisions as opposed to trying to, to think you're smarter than the market. Um, you know, there are a lot of really smart people that do this in, in and out every day. And, and even they get proved, humiliated and proved that they're not smarter than the market on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so there, there's no one out there that's ever proven to be able to get those timing decisions right time after time after time. Maybe you get lucky once or twice, but if, if you try it 10 times, the chances of getting it right eight times are, are very low. Yeah, and humans are really good at remembering that one time and thinking that that one time will always happen. <laughs> so yeah. you're like, I remember I did, I'm a genius. You know, I picked the right stock at the right time. You just got lucky. Um, for myself, you know, I just make sure that when I'm thinking about this, it's just how can I make it as uh, non-emotional as possible and just set a day and every single day um, put in this much or every single week or every single month. And that way, irrespective of what it is, it just happens to be the first or it happens to be, you know, twice per month and then money just goes in. And at some point, you're just going to dollar average it out and you're, you're going to win over time. And the people that are, you know, they they think they're going to right before the earnings call, they buy, you know, and then all of a sudden Amazon, like today, boom, you know, not so good. Um, and you could see everyone buy, buy, buy it right to the top. And then earnings came through, you know, you lose, you lose a nice chunk. So, um, by doing it this way and being non-emotional about it, you actually will come out far, far, far more ahead. And that's one of the ways an advisor can help you is that an advisor is less emotional about your money than you are. That's a good, yeah, that's a, that's a good. And also, you know, um, good advisors to make more money when you make more money. So the incentives are aligned and they know that by being emotional, they won't make as much money. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, we talked a little bit about the 529 savings plan and maybe we talk a little bit about, uh, well, tax loss harvesting sounds complicated, but there's some basics to it that I think people should yeah. just kind of consider. So what, what are those two things? So when you have a stock or an ETF or any investment that's down in your portfolio and it has a loss, you can sell that loss, uh, sell that stock, take the loss, buy something similar or wait 30 days and reinvest and you get to use that loss on your tax return. So you can use up to $3,000 every year on your tax return. So if you're in a, a high tax bracket or a high state, it's, it's a free you know, thousand to $1,500 a year, simply by doing that and setting it against your income when you have an investment that it's a, a loss. Um, you, can, you can sell it now and use it for multiple years as long as you keep track. Um, and then the other thing is you can use it against capital gains. So if you sell stocks and, and keep a loss and, and, and only keep the gains but sell the losses and you sell your business down the road, you can use those losses to offset some of the taxes from selling your business. Or if you sell a real estate property um, that's an active real estate property, you can do that. Or if you sell a stock down the road that has a gain, you can do that. Um, so sometimes you know, that, that tax loss actually becomes an asset to you because you can use it against future gains. Um, and, and that's something that, that makes sense that the $3,000 a year, if you have losses is automatic right off of your income. Um, so that's something you, you want to look for. And then you can use the others against gains and other investments. Yeah. That one's a really simple one that I feel like not enough people do. Um, yeah. it's almost like a gimme if you're doing any kind of investing, because you, if you're doing something, you're probably gonna have some losses somewhere. You might as well capitalize on it. Yeah. The government gives you the ability to time when you take that loss or that gain. So um, one other, on the opposite side of that, if you know that this year is going to be a really bad income year, it might be a good year to take a gain in your portfolio because you're in a lower tax bracket than you'll be in next year. So you can time when you take those losses and gains based on what your income is. Yep. Um, yeah, I like that advice too, because it's on the reverse side. <laughs> and I think a lot of people this year um, will be in a different position than they were last year um, in the upcoming year that, that's coming there. So. Um, on the 529, uh, for those pros that are out there that have kids or even don't have kids yet, um, what, what is that? I've seen that tossed around. Um, what's, what's, what's that to the audience here? Well, a 529 plan um, is, is an educational savings account, and it allows you to, to save money, and the money grows tax-free. It depends on what state you live on, you live in. But residents of certain states also get a tax deduction for putting money into the account. So um, there's a website called savingforcollege.org, I think, that you can go mm -hmm. to and, and see what the best way to do it in your, in your state is. Um, that you can, in California, unfortunately, we don't get a deduction for doing that. Um, but when, um, when it, the assets grow, as long as they're used for education, you don't owe any tax on the growth. 
So one of the reasons that's relevant right now is that if you're putting money into your, your kid's account over time and the values are down right now, now may be a good time to put it in because when they bounce back up, all of that will be tax deferred growth for your kids. The downside of it is it can only be used for education. Um, so you, when you put it in, you're getting the return of the tax break for, for saying you're using it for education, but you can use it for any of your children, any of your grandchildren, nieces, nephews, anything of that nature. And if you don't use it, you just have to, to pay when you, the taxes when you take it out. Yeah. So um, this is uh, probably one of my favorite questions here. Um, if you had $10,000 right now, what would you do with it? I think I would, I would invest that in the U.S. economy. So something like the S&P 500, which is the 500 biggest um, companies here in America. Um, I think that I, I can't tell you, I don't think anyone can tell you right now what the economy is going to look like over the course of the next six months or 12 months. But I can tell you, if you do that and you look back five or 10 years, you're going to be very happy with that decision. Um, so that, that's where I think we, we would look at, um, you know, I, I hesitate to ever give individual stocks or individual ETFs, but, but buying the U.S. economy right now when things are depleted is, is a good thing. You know, had you done that when the things were at their absolute bottom in, in March, you'd have almost a 30% gain right now because when times look bad, that's actually the time that you want to be investing. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. So for all you pros out there, that one's really easy to do. There's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you don't actually need an advisor for that. Not yet, not on your first 10,000, but maybe when you work your way up there, um, you'll, you'll want some help. And, and the, the brokerage houses like Charles Schwab and, and um, TD Ameritrade and Vanguard allow you to set up an account for free and they allow you to trade for free now. So something that would have cost you, you know, $25 to buy five years ago is, is now free. Yep. And there's, um, I like to use Robinhood, but not for all my money. Um, so there's some, some online ones um, that, uh, that give you a little more flexibility and maybe too much power <laughs> for the, for the, for the novice traders. But um, there's some easy stuff out there. There's no reason you shouldn't do it. It takes all of like minutes to set up. Um, so there's no difficulty um, on or off um, either way. So I feel like we've got a lot of um, kind of questions here. Um, I'd like to take the time to get through them because these might be, yeah, these might be a little meaty here. Mm -hmm. Alexa, go ahead. You've been uh, looking at these and on Facebook too. Yes. And I have the ones from Facebook as well. So our first one is from Jacqueline um, Goodrich. Are lenders getting into a more nervous state when we should be concerned as small where, sorry, are lenders getting into a more nervous state where we should be concerned as small businesses with their financing options for customers, or do you see things staying the same? Uh, I think it depends on, on the tone and if it's government guarantees now. So the government is, is pushing the, the banks to lend, um, and the banks love to do those loans because as long as they follow the certain criteria, the, um, the bank will, the, the government will back your, your loan. Um, but I, I do think that, that lending standards are going to tighten up for, for standard business loans. Um, so, I, you know, that's, again, why you want to have a relationship with a, a local bank. Um, the other thing is, you know, right now, interest rates are low, but that's not going to last forever. You know, the Federal Reserve is, has put $9 trillion on their, on their balance sheet. Um, and at some point, um, we're going to have to have, you know, interest rates go up and, and inflation happen. We don't expect that to happen for, for 18 months to two years. But... Um, you know, now is a good time to, to ensure that your credit lines are locked in um, and that you have revolving credit lines and, and all of those type of things. Um, the banks technically usually have a right to shut those down, but they're pretty hesitant to do so because they know that can, can ruin the relationship. So they're not trying That's to close the city yeah. loans yet. Mm -hmm. Especially not in these times. They would get railed. It's not in their interest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there definitely is a, a, you know, an environment right now where, uh, the big banks are getting a lot of government help, getting a lot of government help. They don't want to be seen as not helping the small business owner. Mm. Um, this is a question from Alice West. Would you recommend immediately paying off any extra funds from the PPP or since the interest rate is so low, keep it and invest it in something? Um, I think if you can use it to invest in your, your business, um, you know, the, the rates are so low that as long as you're not taking on too much risk by doing it, uh, the hurdle rate of, of you know, having a 2% profit on, on reinvesting that money by hiring people or equipment um, is very low. And um, 
it's going to last um, a while. I believe it's five years you have to pay it back. Um, it may be longer. They've changed the rules a couple of times. Uh, but, but we think interest rates are, are going higher. So I think that if you can hold on to cash that's at a very low one to two percent rate, um, as long as you, you, know, you are, are getting a return on that money, it probably makes sense to pay that off you know, very slowly um, as opposed to, to return all that cash. Because if there's another leg down to this and, you know, the virus comes back next flu season, all of the same options may not be there. So when times are tight, having extra cash on your balance sheet can be very valuable. Yeah, especially if it's very cheap low as it is. Yeah, with it being so cheap, it's almost impossible not to beat some, somewhere, even if you, I mean, you just throw an S&P 500 if you really want to. Yeah. Um, you're probably going to win. I think the rates are between 1% and 2%. And you can um, you know, put the money in a money market fund at, at close to 1% or a CD at yeah. close to 1%. So you know, the, the opportunity cost of, of less than a percent to hold on to that money is, is very low in terms of just, just having that flexibility. You know, businesses don't usually go out of business because they're a bad business. They're usually, they usually go out of business because they run out of cash. Mm-hmm. Uh, so having extra cash is is helpful there because very often if that business had been able to get through a very short period of time um they would have been fine on the other side amazon's a famous example amazon took i think it was 400 million dollar loan from jp morgan i think it was about 10 days before the tech crash happened and the stock market crashed in 2000 and amazon would not exist for for a company if they'd taken that loan more than 10 days later so they had cash and they were able to make it through that whole 2000 to 2002 time period because they had that line of credit and because they had that, that cash on their, their balance sheet. Um, otherwise, that company would have gone bankrupt with Pets.com and all of those other type of companies back in 2000. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. That's a cool fact. Uh, I think it's by literally 10 days. <laughs> yeah. Timing is everything. So let's see. We have two good questions from Facebook. The first one is, from Wallace Thomas, what's the best way to allocate funds in a rollover IRA right now? Well, I, I hesitate to answer because it depends on what your objectives are. Um, but in general, a rollover IRA um, tends to be a good place for growth because depending on your age, you can't touch that money without a penalty until you're 59 and a half, and you don't have to touch it until you're 72 now. So, um, you know, no one likes to see their balance go down, but in a, in a rollover IRA, it's money that you're not going to be using. So you have the ability to have it go up and down. So we would tend to say that for someone who has a time horizon of over 10 years, um, it makes sense to have a lot of stocks in that portfolio um, as opposed to low interest bonds or, or cash, because you don't need that money next year. It's not going to be money that you can put back into your business. It's not going to be money that you can buy a house with. It's not going to be uh, money that you can use for a vacation. So you have that ability for it to go up and down. Um, so we tend to think that IRAs in general, better place to take risk in your, because you have a longer time horizon with them. Um, so again, kind of broad market, um, you know, take, take some risk and, and live with the ups and the downs, but don't take too much risk that if it goes down, you feel you need to sell it. So, you know, you want to, you want to invest it for the long term, and, um, you know, you know, they, they, Fidelity has a great study that um, they can tell how often you log into your account. And for people who log in every day, they're happy 53% of the time. For people who log in once every 10 years, 98% of them are happy. So try to <laughs> back in the balance and just, you know, look, look at it once every 10 years and, and invest for the future in, in your rollover IRA, assuming that you have at least 10 years until you're 59 and a half. <laughs> That's actually really good advice. Um, and then, our last one I know for sure I can ask. I'm not sure about the, the combining of the last three. Kevin, you can take a look in the Q&A and see if it's something that you are able to answer. But our one from Megan Luthford from Facebook, for the 529, should I have one for each kid or just one combined? You do want to have one for each kid. Um, they do have specific beneficiaries attached to them. Um, but if one of the kids doesn't go to college, you can always transfer it from one kid's name to the other name. Um, so, you know, you tend to want to have, uh, you know, a month, deposit for, for each one of the kids uh, based on kind of their age and how far away they are from college because that money's under their name and dedicated for that but do know that you can move it from one to the other and change the beneficiary if you need to 
So you don't have to force them to use it. <laughs> you can yeah. put it somewhere else. <laughs> if, 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 if one's the good kid and one's the, the bad kid, you can move it from the good kid to the bad kid or bad kid to the good kid, other way around. <laughs> and then uh, if Kevin, you can pop up in the Q&A as a panelist. The last three questions are all within the same theme. And I'm not sure if we're the extent in which we're able to ask those because it's more yeah. suggestion um, piece. You know, I, I can kind of go through it on a, on a um, kind of a big picture level. With small public companies, um, you know, we tend to think that with large companies, there's enough information out there that you can, that if you have a, a, a large enough portfolio, you can create some value by picking individual companies. With smaller companies, when we invest, we tend to want to buy those in a bucket. Um, because any one small company can get hit by something in the economy. So we don't tend to suggest buying small companies as uh, by individual small companies. Now, if it's a company, you know, if it's a company that uh, someone, you know, um, you know, works for and th th those type of things, then maybe it's something that, that you want to um, take a look at, um, you know, with, with, with the large companies, you know, we, we are a little bit more individual specific. You know, but you, you typically don't want to start buying individual stocks until your account is, you know, over a hundred thousand dollars and you can diversify it. There's a lot of research, you know, that shows you know, if you're going to buy individual stocks, you want to buy at least 35 individual stocks or 40 individual stocks so that you're not susceptible to an Enron or to a, a Bear Stearns or, or those type of things. Um, so, um, you know, for, for larger clients who want to be able to, to, to pick very specific things, um, individual stocks can be an example. If you're just getting started, you don't want all your money to be on one company. Um, you know, they're, they're one company, any one company out there can go down 50%. Amazon as a company has gone down 40% eight times. So um, it's done great overall, but Amazon went down 95% uh, one year. Uh, so you got to have a lot of mental fortitude to, to hire that, you know, and they showed those charts and said, here, you know, here's what would have happened if you bought Amazon in 1995 or 1994. Uh, it forgets to say that you probably would have sold it when it was down. You wouldn't have gotten that whole return. Yeah. So um, one question that I would love to ask here is, Kevin, you shared a bunch of just super helpful advice for the pros. Um, I would answer a lot of questions here. Who is a guest, somebody that you know, that you think would be really valuable for our audience here. So anyone in the home services trade, kind of construction, SMB space, who's someone that we should bring on here and interview and kind of give the same types, not the same type of advice, but same caliber of advice that, that you've kind of given our pros. On the financial side or? On any side, it could be someone super interesting that you know, it could be anything. And you have to be willing to introduce us to them so we can actually bring them on. <laughs> Well, that's a tough question. That's, a, that's I guess the first one that stumped me. I, I, I got to think. Um, I might have to get back to you on that one. Um, all right. um, and then our last question for you, Kevin, is when we ask all of our guests. So as Roland said, you've dropped a lot of knowledge on our pros tonight. If you have one piece of advice for them to take out of this and one action that they should take tomorrow morning, what would it be? Um, I, I think the biggest piece of advice and, and clients, people always ask us, what um, who are your happiest clients? And the very simple answer is people who spend less money than they make. And it doesn't matter if you make, you know, a million dollars a year and you spend 1.2 million, you're constantly stressed and unhappy. Or if you make 30,000 and you spend 20,000, you're in a pretty good mental place. So the, the, what I, the advice that goes along with that is I would look at your personal life very similar to how you look at your business life with a balance sheet and an income statement and an idea of where your inflows come and, and where your expenses are and you know what your kind of your profit margin is which is you know, how much money more money you bring in than you spend um, and you want to look at it as your balance sheet what are your assets are they your home your business your stocks your your cds your bank account versus what are your liabilities your mortgage your credit card debt all of those type of things and you want to Position yourself so that your assets are, are more than your liabilities. So that you have a, a positive net worth the same way that, that you want to do that uh, with the business. That's great advice. And so oh, here, I thought of an answer and I'll say this because my wife's watching. Yeah. I think you interview an educator about how to take stress off at home for all your pros uh, who have kids at home and uh, they or their family are trying to um, do their own <laughs> job and um, uh, at the same time, uh, teach, you know, uh, teach third grade at their house. So uh, yeah. I, I'd recommend my wife or, or someone from her school that can, uh, that can talk to you about, you know, best tips for, for keeping your, your children happy while you're trying to keep your business alive. That's a really Great good title. one. 
<laughs> yeah, we got a lot of people saying chat. Yes, I yes, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put you in touch there. Awesome. awesome. And before we let you go, Kevin, where we we are coming out with um, a blog post with Kevin. Um, it will it'll probably be released tomorrow or beginning of next week, and we'll send it out to all of you. It'll be available on the housecallpro.com slash coronavirus resources. Um, but for now, Kevin, if pros are interested in reaching out to you, or where can they find you online? Um, so the company name is Miracle Mile Advisors. Um, we tend to work with existing investors, but we're happy to, to answer questions. Um, and I think my, my personal email address will be on the, the blog that goes out. Uh, it's, it's, K, it's Kevin K. Barlow at, at MiracleMileAdvisors.com. Um, and, you know, we tend to work with um, business owners and um, professionals to, to help them create both a, both a financial plan and a um, uh, investment strategy that works for them. And then the other thing we do a lot of work on as well, um, Roland mentioned that there's some of the, the pros here that are in kind of multi-generational businesses. We do a lot of work with estate planning and succession planning for people who are looking to sell their business um, or transition it to um, family members or the next generation of the business. Um, now can be a great time to do that because, you know, if you have a year where your revenues are down and you're trying to transition the business to your kids, you can do that at a discounted rate and still get a loan back from your kids. So we do a lot of work with, with that as well for kind of larger business owners. Awesome. So I just threw Terrific. that information in the chat. I also put it in the Facebook thread. Um, other than that, thank you, Kevin. I want to go over um, you feel free to stick around or you can cut your video and we'll um, let you know when the blog post is sent out and you guys can get a hold of Kevin. But um, I want to talk about two things, our schedule for next week and then um, the postcard deal. So let's first talk about postcards. So as you know, at the beginning of April, we made all postcards in House Call Pro 50% off. And um, if you didn't have it on your account, then we made it available on your account. So if you're on like the start or simple plan. Um, so we're actually extending that all the way through May. So make sure to take advantage of those. Roland, Natalie, myself, we did a um, we did a whole evening update on this and how to do these postcards. There's an incredible suite of graphics and postcard templates in there for you. So continue to take advantage of those if you have been. Um, I've seen some people who've even posted in the chat saying that they've gotten jobs out of the postcards that they're sending. So make sure you're taking advantage of those all through May. It's spring clean in time. Uh, and next, we want to talk about our schedule for next week. So on Monday, we have Brandon Vaughn, crowd favorite, coming back on with us uh, yeah. on Monday. And we're talking about hiring landmines to watch out for in a recession economy. And then we are actually talking with Gary Ridge. He's the CEO of WD40. That's going to be an incredible one on pillar, his pillars of leadership that he uses in his company uh, on Wednesday, we have Gusto, Will Lopez with Gusto meeting with us. And then uh, our special guest is Barbara Cochran for Thursday. So any questions that you have and you wanna ask Barbara, please make sure to submit them to us. We'll um, post something in the Facebook group, but um, we want to make sure that we get your questions answered by her in our program outline. Uh, Roland, do you have anything else? That's it. We want to thank Kevin again for coming on. He, he jumped off here, but thanks again, Kevin. We're going to be posting his um, blog. That way you guys can get access to some of the things that we covered as well as his information. Yeah. And we're super excited for next week. Obviously, Mark Cuban came through and gave us the Barbara Cochran yeah. uh, introduction. So she'll be on on Thursday. It's going to be super awesome. And then other than that, have a great weekend, pros, and mm -hmm. we'll see you soon. We'll see you soon. We'll see you in the coronavirus Facebook group. Talk to you Monday. Bye.